our note to you is perhaps, you know, jot this down, remind yourself of the, of the content of this. Secondly, the commercial playbook. Um, the commercial playbook um, is, is an interesting one. It, well, I say it's an interesting one. It's not interesting. Um, the, the commercial playbook, it, it's basically a guide for government outsourcing for, for government departments. Um, it was put together by the civil service, mainly in, a, in an effort to improve when and how they procure external companies to deliver public services. I'm not saying that it was, um, it was put in place because of the whole Carillion disaster, but um, it seems to have come out at a similar time. Um, again, the, the playbook is important context for any supplier of services um, that are ultimately paid for by the public purse, so please be aware of it. In terms of the second bullet point, enables DWP to react to future pipeline known and unknown. So this is an interesting one. Future pipeline unknown and known. Our view, perhaps not in the words of DWP, is that this means that the DWP need a framework that, that, that can react and be broad enough to cope with um, difficult financial circumstances in the future. And quite frankly, we're, we're talking about recession, higher unemployment, redundancies, um, all those wonderful things. But essentially, they're, they're expecting to have greater need to pull on uh, an external provider network. Therefore, they want this uh, umbrella framework to give them um, I suppose, a, a better starting point to do that. Okay. Uh, the second slide. Thank you. The key thing to take from this, the code of conduct. This details the basic principles of how governments should do business with suppliers, um, basically to the benefit of public services. This is a PDF which is available on the Bravo site under the umbrella agreement. In a moment, um, Kat and I are going to show you where some of the documents are held on Bravo. Um, it may be, um, Elizabeth and Ursa, that you might want to also host some of these key documents on your website. It might be quite useful for, for members to access them quite easily through Ursa. Anyway, just a thought. Um, the code of conduct, I think, is important because it provides helpful indicators for how suppliers should approach key risk areas that you are going to get asked on in the process, like uh, cybersecurity, sustainable procurement, et cetera, et cetera. The, the point, again, about both of these slides that I've just gone through in terms of policy is be aware of and digest the information relating to the code of conduct, the improving lines report, and the commercial playbook. Okay, Kat. Okay. So bas basically the scope and nature of the, uh, I don't even know how to pronounce it now, it's a very difficult acronym, uh, the Employment and Health Related Services Umbrella Agreement. It's support for individuals, so contracts that provide support for individuals um, to find and train for employment. Um, they will be looking at some specific call-off programs to address barriers to employment. Uh, so, for example, for certain cohorts, maybe lone parents, NEETs, etc. Um, and it will allow providers to work directly themselves for direct delivery or through a supply chain. I think supply chain management, as we will touch on later in the, the webinar, is a very, very key thing for the Department of Work and Pensions through this process. They want to know how organisations are really going to work with their supply chain. And touching on the uh, point on Tony's slide previously about partnership relationships rather than transactional. One of the things that came out of the uh, market warming event was they want to really encourage providers to work collaboratively and work together. And that's not just in a prime contractor delivery partner supply chain relationship. It's also between uh, prime contractors. Um, they're looking at potentially on a national contract, putting in performance bonuses that relate to whole contract. So to encourage all of the providers to work together. The geographies. So the, the proposed lots, uh, Scotland is included in this now. Um, apparently they, Department of Work and Pension said that they have agreement with Scotland, even though it is a devolved area. Um, they're massive geographies. 
I think um, they will be looking for a certain level of providers, tier one providers who can cover off the whole of each lot. Um, we're not sure how that's going to translate for tier two and tier three. We'll come to that in a second. Um, and the call off contracts that sit under that may be whole lot, or they could look at uh, smaller areas within a lot. So maybe looking at um, a local enterprise partnership area for some of the pilots. And that's still to be decided by the DWP. Um, one thing, Kat, sorry, just one thing I was going to say about the lots as well is that um, at the moment, these lots look like they're going to encompass the devolved areas. Um, and this kind of makes sense from a, a department point of view, because if they, if they get the framework in place, which encompasses all those devolved authorities, then at least when they come to the call off contracts, they can decide on a contract by contract basis whether the devolved authorities are in, a, in or out of scope. Um, so I think that's, that's probably an important point to note as well. Good point, Tony. Thank you. So we talked about the tiers before, um, touched upon them in, previously in the webinar. This slide here is still to be decided, to be confirmed by Department of Work and Pensions. This was the thought processes at the market warming event that there would be three tiers, tier one call offs over 5 million, tier two call offs between one and five, and tier three all call offs up to 1 million. And the, the driving force behind this is to allow smaller to medium sized organizations to be able to, to bid for contracts in their own right, rather than having the big super primes mopping everything up or putting contracts up that are potentially too small for the really large primes to even consider. Um, we're gonna to come to timelines in a minute, but uh, I think the, the tier one and tier two will be coming imminently, tier three will be coming later on next year. So we've talked a little bit about uh, previous frameworks. I'm not going to talk through these slides into too much detail, but what I wanted to do, and this is for you to take away, is have a look at how the thought processes within DWP have changed over the last 10 years. So in 2010, there was the, the original framework, the Employment Related Support Services. Um, interestingly on this one, there were 11 lots, there were 91 individual bidders, and 36 of those that submitted bids for the framework were su successful. Switch forward to 2016, the last umbrella, uh, there were six lots and one national lot, so the lot sizes are the same as the new umbrella. Um, there were only 35 different bidders in total and 11 providers secured a place on the framework. And I think that in part was because it was geared towards being used just for the really, really big contracts. And what Department of Work and Pensions has seen from that is um, when smaller contracts have been let through the framework, there's been less appetite for the super primes, as I call them, to bid for some of them. So there's been risk of market failure in some areas. Um, and also the other thing we've seen is through mergers, acquisitions, and also organizations um, falling by the wayside, the number of providers that they originally had in each lot. So they had five in, in all of the lots apart from Southern England where there were six. In some areas, they've dropped down to three providers on the lot, so it makes it less competitive. So they really are looking with this new umbrella framework to open it up and kind of reinvigorate the sector, which I think is a very positive thing. What I did as part of the pre preparation for this was I had a look through the information, uh, the invitation to tender packs for the last two framework agreements um, and to look at the, the similarities between the kind of information that they were looking for. And we're going to come back to this in, at the end of the, the webinar. Um, but it's basic qualification criteria, finance, and, uh, including um, your. So, last year's accounts, but also uh, working capital ability, data security, contract performance, ability to manage supply chains, how you work uh, closely with stakeholders and linking in with other services is something that was brought in for the last umbrella. 
understanding of the local areas and the specific delivery challenges within those local areas and stakeholder engagement. Those are the common themes that have come through the last two. And I have a feeling that these will come up again in the next umbrella framework. So the timeline, which I know is what some of you are all waiting for. Originally, Department of Work and Pensions announced with glee that the uh, tendering process for this would start sometime this week. Um, for those people who are listening who are involved with business development, the good news is they've given us Christmas off. Um, they've taken on board the feedback from people who said it's really unfair to expect organisations and particularly smaller organisations <coughs> to bust a gut over the Christmas holidays. So they're now putting out an invitation to tender for tier one and tier two in January 2020. Um, and they are doing further mar market engagement um, and um, talking to organisations that might be looking at tier three to find out how that process needs to look for them. So there'll be a separate invitation to tender for them later in 2020. I think part of that decision comes from the fact that the, the tier three organisations will probably need a lighter touch tendering process, particularly around things like data security requirements. So tier one and tier two, for example, you'd expect to be up to speed with cyber essentials, ISO, etc. But maybe that's not the case for tier three. Okay, um, we've got three slides here on Bravo itself, but Kat, if you can just flick back to the last slide ever so quickly, if you don't mind. So um, I'm anticipating that not everyone on this um, webinar will have seen this particular message, which um, this is a good illustration of, uh, I suppose, some of the difficulties with the, the Bravo process, uh, which, which I will come on to. But the, this message was posted to the um, Bravo virtual data room. Um, and I'm afraid that didn't necessarily communicate a message out via email or anything else to um, to those people who've got Bravo accounts. So this is this is a message that's taken directly from Bravo. But again, not all of you may have seen this. So if you want to flick down a slide, we've in, we've included these um, these slides basically because just in in conversations, some suppliers have suggested that. The whole Bravo process is part of the <laughs> the problem. It's it's difficult to engage with. So we wanted to include a bit within this webinar to highlight the most important bits. And I hope that this is useful and helpful to you. Um, just to reiterate again, if you're not aware, Bravo or DWP Bravo, I should say, and the and the web address is there. This is where you you should get all of the information relating to this umbrella agreement procurement process, and the subsequent call off contracts, which will come out when it's all set up. So um, part of our plea to you today is um, set up an account if you haven't got one. And this slide um, should help you to, once, you, once you're actually doing it, don't do it now, you're listening to us, um, should help you to, to guide you through the process if you haven't done it before. So for example, that blue arrow, which I think is pointing to the word uh, register, but my eyesight is appalling, Underneath that um, button, there's something which says click here for details on how to register. This will load you up a very helpful PDF document, which will help you set up your account. Um, so again, if you're, on, if you're on the webinar and you don't have one, um, we would suggest that you certainly go ahead and get this already. To go back to my um, point before about um, the importance of engaging with the portal, um, we know that the, the previous message, which had the holly leaf on it, um, that wasn't sent out directly as in proactively to um, providers. So you do need to be keeping on top and regularly going into the, the Bravo system. Okay, so oh, thank you, the, the next slide. Um, so da, 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 da. But this is how to access the bit of information that doesn't get sent out, the virtual data yes. room. This, we would recommend really just keeping hold of this slide when you get access to it and, and referencing this. So if you're not familiar with the Bravo system, this is a key thing that you need to be looking at. So for example, 
On the, on the left there, you will see various icons and the one that we've highlighted is the file sharing. So this screenshot shows you the, you know, the, how to access the virtual data room and all the key information. So you select the file sharing one, then file to access all the documents. Um, and as the DWP say, the virtual data room is going to be used as the main repository and com communication vehicle, if you like, if you like, for all of the information uh, in relation to this umbrella agreement. Um, and as they have said already in there, it will be shared within this virtual data room on an iterative basis. So whenever they have something else to communicate, they'll load it into here. Okay. Uh, as a as an example, here's some of the key things that we mentioned earlier. Um, the outsourcing playbook and the supplier code of conduct. These are available for you once you've set up your account and accessed the umbrella area. Um, again, if you haven't already, you should read through these documents um, as a good starting point before the umbrella um, commissioning process kicks off. Okay. Go for it, Cal. <laughs> so the big question you're probably sitting at and asking yourselves whilst you're absorbing all of the information from the, the webinar is, is this opportunity for me? And I think um, it's really important in the sector to do that evaluation and not just go for everything just because it's there. Um, I think if you are already a prime contractor, um, obviously you're going to be going for this. I think for smaller to medium sized organisations, the question to ask is, do you want to be a prime contractor and uh, have all of the um, thing, things that you will need to do in terms of data security, um, managing DWP systems, etc. Is this something that you want to take on board? Do you want to make a commitment to key standards, for example, the Merlin standard? Um, with the Merlin standard, as part of the procurement for this, organisations that aren't currently, currently prime contractors will need to make a commitment to achieve the Merlin standard if they're successful winning a call-off contract. The Merlin standard is uh, a standard for prime contractors in, in terms of how they manage um, and interact with their supply chains. Um, You'll need to make a commitment to Cyber Essentials Plus. If you haven't already got that, you'll have to make a commitment to achieving disability confidence if you haven't got that. So it's looking at the organisation and thinking, is this something that we want to make a commitment to? Also, and this is a really important question, are your finances in shape? If you look at your finances and think, well, DWP are going to be evaluating them as part of this process, if you don't think it's going to get through, don't waste time and money uh, because for a lot of organisations there will be um, ad additional cost in terms of getting your staff to pull all the information together for this process. If you think you're going to get, uh, not going to get through the first hurdle, don't go for it. Tier three, I think ah. more information is going to come out as part of market, market engagement. So you don't need to make a decision now, but what I would absolutely urge is engaging um, with DWP through URSA um, to get involved in the surveys that are going to come out, the marketing market engagement events that they're going to have so that you can put your thought processes into um, the decision making that DWP will do around this to help shape the process. Um, the other thing as well is if you're a, an organisation that, you know, at the end of this, you think this isn't for me, this is still something to watch because the organisations that get onto this framework are going to be your potential supply chain, or you'll be a supply chain partner to them um, as call-off contracts come out over the next four years. So I said earlier that I'd gone through the... Um, invitation to tender packs for the last two umbrella framework rounds um, and these are the kind of things that I think that they are going to be asking you to um, address in your tenders. Interestingly page limits page limits change from tender round to tender round even for the same question so I have seen it where in one tender round you get a perfectly crafted two-page 
responds to the question around stakeholders and then you get to the next tender round and somebody's asked the same question but you have to pad out five five pages of a4 so you can't always rely on having past stuff to be able to well, copy and paste across into this or tweak into this um but it's worth if as part of your evaluation of whether this is something for you it's worth looking at these questions and thinking am i going to be able to answer these questions properly and do i have the evidence in place for them so there will be a standard supplier questionnaire with the mandatory exclusions discretionary exclusions etc they will look at your financial uh, strength and working capital particularly for tier ones and tier twos there'll be uh, a lot of questions i assume about data security feedback we've had so far is when it comes to tier three that will be much more light to touch previous performance interestingly um what we've seen is it's not necessarily about your outcome performance it the questions are around how you've uh, managed contracts and how you've managed supply chains to be able to achieve performance and as with all of the other questions that we're going to touch on, it's really important that um, everything that you say is underpinned by a strong evidence base. Uh, and DWP do take that quite seriously in, in how they evaluate your responses. Um, supply chain, they want to know your approach to building, managing and improving supply chains. Integration, this is where it comes into the local um, side of things so that the, the top questions up to supply chain will be generic normally there's uh, you do one response regardless of how many lots you're going for the integration implementation delivery challenges and stakeholders you will normally need to provide a re response for each of those questions or set of questions for each of the lots that you're going for because they demand the local information um, implementation they want to know how you would implement contract quickly evidence of how you've done that previously and how you've been able to do it without it impacting on other contracts um, the delivery challenges is the real local stuff that they'll be looking for they'll want to you to demonstrate your understanding of um, the the lot specific challenges in terms of the customer groups that you anticipate might come through some of the geographical challenges maybe even some of the challenges within uh, local services that are available etc and your stakeholders again it's your understanding of who's important in the areas that, the, that you're looking at who you would engage with how you'll engage with them and your experience of doing something similar um, again we, we don't know exactly what this is going to look like for this tend around um, but i think in in the first framework, uh, there was something like responses ranging from two to five pages. I think in the last one, responses ranging from uh, one to four pages. So these are not small questions. And some of them, like supply chain in the last framework, there were three individual questions under that subheading. Um, I don't know, Tony, maybe you can answer this, if we can share previous ITTs through URSA, that might be an idea, so people can have a look at how previous questions panned out. Um, I, don't know, I don't know what DWP would say about that, but my opinion would be, I think it would be very useful for people to look at past papers, certainly, because that will help to understand the, the, the undertaking that this is likely to look like. So perhaps if we can put a note in that, Elizabeth, to to ask our friends at DWP whether or not, if it's in the public domain, that those um, past um, ITT specs and questions can be shared. Because um, I, I, I agree with you, Kat, one of the things that I think is, is really interesting when looking at the past stuff is the, is the size and scale of, of of what you need to re reply to the several thousand words um it's no small undertaking and i suppose the other key thing is that um if you're going for multiple lots then you are going to be doing that multiple times as well in some cases so i guess in 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 seeking to wrap up the um the webinar before we start to take questions um Again, it's more of a reiteration. We can't guarantee what exactly the EVP are going to do or what they're going to ask. But I think if we can get um, people access to previous um, questions, that will be very helpful. Um, 
so that people can start to plan. Um, I think that you, whilst you talk about getting Christmas back, I, I'm of the opinion that this, this time is a very useful time to spend preparing for, for when this drops because it will be um, significant for businesses to, to respond to. Um, and I guess the, the, I don't know if people can read this slide, but one of the things that perhaps isn't, isn't on here, you have alluded to, to it, Kat, is that some organisations may not wish to um, prime on, on this agreement, but I still think for those organisations who perhaps want to act as a significant end-to-end -end subcontractor, there's still work for them to be done here as well. So they may also wish to prepare similarly on the, on the questions, because uh, as we know, the questions will often flow down through um, expressions of interest forms. So it's for everyone to really be starting to prepare for this, this next iteration. And for those, and for those folk who are looking to, to subcontract, or I'd also say that you should be thinking about your partner engagement strategy, um, how you articulate your value proposition and how this, and how your service fits in with um, your target partners. And I, I guess just from experience, one of the things that also can work well is, is challenging yourself as well and picking holes in your own offer so that you can um, adequately um, answer questions posed of you. So that a commissioner or a potential prime has already got the answers available to them. I guess, I guess all in all the message is preparation is key really. This is a, this is a, um, something that comes around only every few years with the, the department for the bigger ticket um, program. So I think it's not, it's a window not to be missed, basically. Um, Kat, I am pretty much finished. Is there anything else you want to add before we look at some questions? No, I think let's dive into the questions and uh, see what people are throwing at us. So Elizabeth or Laura, have you got questions that you want to throw at us? Are you on mute? <laughs> I'm back. Um, you mentioned the commercial playbook. Is this the same as the outsourcing playbook that was in the Bravo virtual data room? Yes, is, this, is the simple question. I've called it the commercial one because it, it covers, um, well, a fair bit of their, com their commercial considerations, but it is the outsourcing playbook. Okay, um, another question that's been put to us already at Ursary is, um, will they expect primes to only commission tier two, three providers as part of their supply chains? Um, you, you know, in the way that a lot of the skills funding agency wants people that are on the roto rota, has there been any indication of anything like that? That people will have to be an appro approved provider to deliver no. services? No, I don't think it's, I don't think they're looking at that. Good. I just wanted to get that one out of the way. <laughs> yeah. Okay. There's more. Only go for easy ones, Elizabeth. I am. I'm waiting for Laura to... Uh... We're just going to hand it over to Laura who can see more questions than I can. Hi, sorry about that. Um, okay, is there any indication as to whether this will form a platform for commissioning the Shared Prosperity Fund? That's a good question. Um, Kat, shall I start? Yep. So, um, I believe that the DWP team are split into three groups who commission, for example, the Job Centre Plus DPS system, this team who look at um, the kind of major national groups, and then the other one which looks at the DPS test and learn. And at the moment, ESF is, where does that sit? Does that sit in with the test and learn team? At the moment, but anything could change. 
I guess that's the current situation, but I, it's possible, isn't it, that they could use this for the Shared Prosperity Fund? Well, I think it's, it's not 100% decided that the no. Shared Prosperity Fund will go through DWP yet anyway. I think there's some um, yeah, discussions going on about who it sits with. If it falls to DWP, they probably will be using this, but it may fall under Tier 3 as opposed to Tiers 1 and 2, depending on what it looks like. Does that answer the question? I think it does with what we know so far. Okay, we, can so, put, we can put that one to DWP. Yeah. Um, we've had a question, will the election dash change of government have an impact on this? Um, this is Elizabeth reading it out. I've asked this question of the DWP this week and they've said no, it will carry on. Um, that shouldn't have any impact at all. Um, another question we've had is, has there been an indication as to how contracts will be paid, i.e. payment by results? There hasn't been an indication, but I think we're expecting that these will be payment by results contracts, but we won't know till they're procuring using the new umbrella, will we? And I think what they may be looking at for the tier three contract in particular is a different, slightly different payment mechanisms because they appreciate that smaller organisations maybe don't have the working capital to do uh, wow. contracts that are quite as payments by results heavy as existing um, contracts under the current umbrella. I would agree. I, th I think that what DWP have been reasonably open about is, is um, lessons learned from how they've changed the market over the past God knows how long. And I think they've certainly seen that some some excellent providers who, who perhaps are smaller, don't have that working capital, have been excluded from the process. And they, they want to, they want to have a healthier market of providers that they can direct, directly contract with. So maybe it's up to us actually to help influence that, um, that tier three commissioning. Okay, um, we have another question here. Do we expect that all tier one and two contracts will require the prime? to subcontract, e.g. not to deliver entire contract directly? I think that will depend on the contract. Absolutely. I don't think that they're not going to be prescriptive about that. I don't, I, I don't disagree. Um, I think it's okay to say that I, I think they'll still expect to see a fair bit of uh, localization and integration with local partners. But yeah, I'm not sure that they'll stipulate that you must do it. Yeah. Um, hi, this is Laura. Um, we've got a, a question about the Bravo data room. Um, so if you could just elaborate what that was. I'm, I'm really sorry, I didn't quite hear the question. Um, it was a, a question on the Bravo data room uh, and what was that? Okay. Kat, can you, would it be okay to flick back to that slide? Oops, which one? This one. Um, perhaps the one before that. Um, so this, this entire process is going to, I suppose, run through this online portal, the DWP Bravo. So um, eventually all of the ITT and specification documents, all the documents in fact, will be housed within this portal. And the, the slide, I think, again, before this one, Hang on. um, will show, yes, this, um, this log on and the registration process. I, I, I hope I'm answering the question here. I'm sorry if I'm, I'm, I'm being a bit silly, but this is where any provider who wishes to, um, I suppose, engage directly with this process will need to get a, a, a um, a logon for the DWP Bravo portal and to access the documents through the virtual data room um, and this process here will show you how to register. Um, maybe, maybe there's something about providing a bit more detail about how to select opportunities within the DWP system which we can circulate as well. Okay, we've got another question. Um, do we know if the lots can be scaled up as well as down? Um, the, the lots can, well, they've given themselves the, the flexibility to say that they can combine 
lots in future commissioning as well as breaking up lots so whilst they're setting out the seven lots they're basically saying that we can we can um, commission sublot or multi-lot how that will play out i don't know okay um another question on the financials are we expecting a spreadsheet to confirm suitability for lots in terms of i don't know that's the extent of the question maybe maybe the person who's raised that could give us a bit more of an indication what they're looking for yeah we can go back to dwp on on that one interestingly yeah. one of the things that i didn't mention when, when talking about the procurement process so the thinking at the market warming uh, event was rather than providers bidding for a tier you just bid to the framework and then DWP will allocate providers to tiers. Not 100% sure how that's going to work out. Just thought I'd throw that in there. Okay. Um, there has been a question is, is there an, any indication that tier three is for specialist providers who work for specific clients groups? If so, might they allow for more than five to cover those groups? I don't think we've had anything on that, have we, from the DWP? I think there was some discussion on, on the, the, the market engagement events um, about how that would work, but oh, particularly for specialist niche providers that might cover bigger geographical areas, how that would fit. And I think that, again, is something that they will probably bring, in, bring into the Tier 3 survey and the next set of Tier 3 events. Yeah. I agree. And I think whoever has asked the question and for others, it's, um, I guess, it, a, a plea to be involved in that process with DWP, help to influence how they go about um, the commissioning process for the tier three. I certainly think it could involve specialist localised organisations. But um, yeah, if, you, if you're not telling them how it's going to work best for the, the clients who will ultimately access your service, then they may not take in, into, into account the, the important stuff you're thinking about. Okay. Um, we're being asked if we anticipate a cohort specific to people with mental health issues. That could potentially come out as one of the call off contracts down the line. Um, they may be looking at things like that, but they, they haven't been explicit at this stage. I suppose the, I suppose it's, it's imminently possible, given that this is um, an employment and health related um, process. Um, I guess I'd like to see one. <laughs> um, it's certainly in scope, but they haven't indicated, as, as Kat has said. But if you look at things like the previous um, access to work support for people with mental health, I can't remember this, the exact name of the contract, but they have done that, that previously. So um, I would imagine that there may be uh, some stuff down the line that is specifically for people with mental health issues. Yeah, and I suppose also people should um, make themselves aware of the DWP Test and Learn initiative, which there have been a couple of specific pilot programmes um, being commissioned. And that um, is, is a different process and vehicle to this, but it's something that, again, people should be aware of. Perhaps we should do another webinar. <laughs> Um, another question we've been asked is Tony touched on the tier two and three providers um, that they should start preparing themselves and people are asking if we're saying they should be approaching primes or is that too premature? Um, I, I guess if you think about how these these things often play out um, and certainly within the you know, Merlin process the organizations that know who, who that they're going to prime for this will will aim to engage with the market anyway, either through an EOI process or um, through different ways of engaging. My experience is that if you're an organization who thinks you will be um, wanting to supply to the perhaps the larger organizations, I would say, go and have a conversation, contact them, tell them who you are, tell them what you can do, show them your MI and get yourself on their radar. That's my view, not necessarily the DWP approach. And I don't think DWP would really comment or advise on that if you are a smaller provider go and work out who you're going to uh, be working with okay great um we've got a 
question um, from somebody who's struggling to understand why an organisation would limit itself to any one tier. Um, and they'd follow up with a second question. If you're able to deliver a £1 million contract, you can likely deliver a £10 million contract. Good question. So, Go on, <laughs> So DWP are going to allocate organisations to the tier. I think if you're a smaller organisation, for example, with a turnover of, uh, of half a mil, they're not going to give, uh, I don't think they like giving organisations contracts that are more than 50% of turnover because they want to make sure that organisations don't grow too quickly and topple over. Um, yes. There is some debate still about how the contracting process will work, whether tier one providers can still bid for tier two, two and tier three contracts. And I think that that is something that they will be looking at, but maybe making the commissioning process for call of contracts under tier three slightly different so that they're more accessible and geared towards the strengths of the smaller organizations rather than to the larger organizations with big business development bid writing teams. And I think that's something that's going to come out through the, the tier three engagement process. Does that answer the question? I think so. Um, I've got a further question. Um, at the consultation event, the DWP said there will be an emphasis on Merlin for providers on the umbrella agreement. Does this mean the DWP will require providers to be working towards Merlin accreditation? when they apply, um, and if so, what evidence would the DWP require from providers to prove this is the case? So Merlin will only apply if you're currently a prime contractor anyway. Um, so if you're not currently delivering a prime contract and you're applying for this, that all you'll need to do is make a commitment to working towards achieving Merlin standard if you get a call off contract under the framework. Um, so you, you, it's not something that you can start doing if you're not currently delivering a prime contract. Um, in, um, in a similar but, vein, sorry to cut across there, whoever that was, but in a, um, at the event they also discussed uh, other ways of um, other ways of testing uh, folk, and, and one of those would be disability confident and. Uh, probably for tier one, they're going to expect um, disability confident level three, but for lower tiers, they will be expected to be, able to be working towards uh, getting up the disability confident level. So I think those things will definitely be confirmed, of course, when, um, when they come to market with this. Okay, so we've got two more questions. Um, now we've got more than that. We're going to be really quick. Um, have we been given any information on the balance of contracts between the tiers, i.e. what percentage of overall value for each tier? Short answer, no, not yet. Okay, and do we expect London and Greater Manchester to be included within the lots? They will be included in the framework agreement. Um, uh, I don't think they're, going to, they're not going to take devolved areas out because there is a chance as they go through the call-off contract pr process under the framework that some contracts will exclude devolved areas, whereas some, like IPES that's just happened recently, will include the devolved areas. So for framework purposes, um, they will leave the devolved areas in. Okay. Um, are we expecting there to be a spreadsheet to guide providers to understand which tier they could bid for based on finances? We anticipate DWP giving us more information over the coming weeks about how that's likely to work. But from the initial event, it was you apply for the framework and they allocate you um, to a tier. And we have asked, I think a lot of people in the in the, the two sessions asked for further information and guidance on that. So we, we need to get that from DWP. Okay. Yeah. Are we expecting Merlin to be mandatory? If you're successful getting a call off contract under this, then absolutely yes, but it's not something that you need to have in place before bidding. Um, I think it might be worth circulating links to things like Cyber Essentials and the Merlin Standard and Disability Confidence so that organisations can easily access and find the information 
about what they would be expected to achieve, to do and achieve if they were successful, not just in getting, not in getting on the framework, but in winning call off contracts under the framework. Okay, we're being asked if the DWP um, could encourage a standardised expression of interest for primes to use to reduce the workload. Um, I will pick that up from Ursa, but I do know when it's been raised before, primes explained they had different delivery models and wanted to ask different questions. I don't think we've ever got very far with that, but we can try again. Um, if I can just step in on that, uh, Elizabeth, I don't think at this stage, because it's a framework and you don't, you won't necessarily need to have a supply chain in place for the framework. Yeah. The, the supply chains will come in for the call of contracts that fall under the framework. So I, if you're a smaller organisation that is looking to be a supply chain partner, I wouldn't panic that you're going to get hit with a load of expressions of interest requests at this stage. That will come when call of contracts come down the line. Okay. Um, and I think we're on the last question in case, unless Laura notices I've missed anything. Is this a two-stage process, e.g. a PQQ followed by an ITT? And will supply chains need to be fixed in the next stage of commissioning? Or is, this not, is it not needed for the framework? I think that touches on the, the previous answer. So um, I think it's going to be a one-stage process. There may be some uh, further commercial due diligence after tenders have gone in, but supply chain partners don't need to worry at this stage about expressions of interest in getting stuff into to, um, primes. Um, that will come as the call off contracts come further down the line. Okay. Um, and finally, just one thing, um, Tony mentioned the mess specific message in the data room. Can we make sure that people know what we were referring to, Tony? Sure. So, yeah. I think it's called document four, Tony. Document four, is that how it's labelled in the data room? Um, something like that. Hang on. I might even be able to see it. It's, it's, it's actually on this slide here. It's the bottom document, number four, four update on next steps and proposals, dot doc X. That's right. Uh, we have put the question back to DWP to say if, if providers are signed up and registered and getting information through the data room, that there should be some kind of push out to inform people of important notifications. This came out on the 25th of November, um, and I don't think a lot of people picked up that it was actually there, which, but it's really important information for the sector. Okay, thanks, Kat. Okay, I think that's it. We've covered all the questions. Um, we are re the slides will be shared. We've recorded this. We'll re be repeating it on Monday. Um, there will be a further opportunity to join the webinar with the DWP, uh, we believe. We're just waiting for a date from them for that. Um, and uh, can I just thank Tony and Kat for delivering that for us? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.